On behalf of the Mead Public Library, it is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker. Uh, Mr. Frost was a photographer for the Chicago Sun-Times, who was part of a very influential um, undercover operation that the newspaper conducted to expose corruption in the city of Chicago. Um, this is his story, and so without further ado, photographer Jim Frost. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, it's been quite an experience for me that, as you find out, uh, this uh, story actually uh, is 40 years old. So uh, uh, I was, uh, you, you'll see, uh, you'll see uh, a picture of me 40 years ago, <laughs> and uh, you'll have to point out which one is me. <laughs> but anyway. Um, uh, I'm going to work from notes because as I was explaining uh, to Carol, the, um, uh, there is so much to this story. Uh, I mean, there's a book this thick that was written after it had been published. Uh, there is so much to this story that if I don't follow the notes, we'll be here through the cocktail hour tonight. <laughs> so uh, this will keep me, uh, keep me in line uh, and make sure that I don't uh, get things mixed up. So uh, before we start, uh, before we really get to the meat of this project, I'm going to try to give you uh, uh, an overview, uh, an overview of, of the whole uh, situation, the scenes, so that when we get into it, uh, you'll have uh, some uh, perspective of where things are taking place and what is taking place. So we, it is June 1977. Um, I was uh, uh, just a rookie at the Sun-Times. Uh, this was my third newspaper I had worked for. I started at, a, um, at the Wisconsin Rapids Daily Tribune, uh, and we had an a editorial staff of about 12 people. Uh, it was a great, great paper, or still is, and, uh, and a, a great place for me to uh, cut my teeth as a photojournalist. Uh, from uh, from uh, the Wisconsin Rapids, I went to Arlington Heights, Illinois, uh, and a, a chain of uh, suburban dailies uh, out of Arlington Heights, and I was with them for seven years, um, fine-tuning my portfolio. My, my goal was to, uh, uh, to get on the staff of a, of a uh, metropolitan uh, newspaper, and uh, I was then hired at the, uh, put on the staff at the Sun-Times. So I had only been there two months uh, uh, when uh, I was still uh, learning uh, uh, my co-workers' names. I was uh, still trying to get a handle on uh, how a big city newsroom uh, functions. As I said, the, uh, the Daily Tribune in Rapids was uh, uh, a staff of about 12, uh, the editorial staff. Uh, and uh, in Arlington Heights, uh, I'm, I'm guessing about 60 probably. At the Sun Times, it was over 300. Uh, and uh, we were staffing uh, almost 24 hours a day. Well, uh, for some 24 hours a day. Um, so uh, I was uh, still trying to figure out how a big city newsroom operates and, uh, and still hoping I could make the grade, actually. I was. Uh, well, a little more than a kid, but I was in my uh, 30s. And uh, so I was back in the ready room. The ready room uh, uh, is a place where the photographers uh, had, uh, uh, we wrote our captions back there. The dark rooms were there. We processed our film. We're still back in the day of, uh, of film. And uh, uh, we had dark rooms where we'd process our film and all. And uh, so I'm uh, back in the ready room and uh, where you're kind of waiting while you're doing all of that for that phone on the wall to ring and you get sent out on your next assignment. Uh, so uh, the phone rings and uh, Bob Katalik, he's the chief photographer, he says, Jimmy, Jimmy, get out here in the newsroom. He says, I, I got, uh, somebody wants to talk to you out here. So uh, I walk in, he says, Stu, Stu wants to see you in his office. Well, Stu is the managing editor of the paper and I'm like, oh boy, principal's office time. And uh, so uh, uh, he motions over to, uh, uh, to Stu's office. Uh, I, I walk in that direction, and there was Stu standing at the door waiting for me. Uh, he motions to a chair in front of his desk. And uh, I go sit on the chair. He comes in. He closes the door behind us. Uh, 
sits at his desk. We make, he makes a little bit of small talk, and uh, then he gets down to the nitty gritty. Um, I had been chosen for a high level, I'm being told this now by Stu, I, uh, I, I'm uh, finding out I'm not sitting in the principal's office now. Uh, uh, I had been chosen for a high level undercover investigation project. Uh, I'm, I'm a new kid in town. Uh, uh, it, the um, uh, secrecy is of high level on this project. No one, not even my boss, uh, not my family, no one is to know what, what's going to uh, take place over the next few months. Uh, it would only be referred to as the special. And uh, so, uh, day or night, whenever I got a call, uh, I would uh, just go to the special. You don't ask any questions, you just go. Um, the, the main qualification uh, for me getting this assignment was I was a new kid in town. That uh, we were going up against City Hall on this investigation. I didn't know all of this yet, but we were going up against City Hall in Chicago. The Daily, <laughs> Mayor Daly is in charge. And uh, uh, so uh, being the new kid, uh, if any photographer on that staff would be recognized immediately, uh, walk uh, with the city hall people uh, with they're just very visible and especially in politics in that town um, so uh, I, I was uh, so let's go on to what the uh, uh, let's go on to what the uh, special turned out to be uh, the Sun Times had bought a rundown beat up old bar old tavern uh, near the loop, uh, and um, uh, the main uh, qualification, my main qualification was I was a new kid on the block. The uh, main qualification of this bar was that it was full of violations. It, everywhere you looked, uh, there was leaking pipes, there was exposed wires, uh, you know, in, in Chicago, it's a big deal that all electrical has to go through conduit. Uh, it, it doesn't even have insulation on it. Uh, it, it um, but, but that's what uh, uh, Pam uh, was uh, looking for. Pam was the, uh, leading up the investigation on this, is uh, a place that would, when inspectors would come in, uh, they, anybody, you didn't have to be a, 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 an expert uh, to be able to uh, spot the violations. Uh, the objective of this project was simple. Rumors were rampant uh, of corrupt, uh, corrupt city officials um, uh, that were extracting bribes from small businesses, and particularly taverns. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but no one would go on record uh, as uh, uh, with their story. And none of the bar uh, owners, uh, they, they would complain uh, that, uh, that we're getting hit all the time, that you've got to pay this, got to pay that to get a pass, to get pay this to get a pass. But nobody would, uh, would uh, go on record uh, with the story uh, in, or be interviewed about it. It would have been business suicide for them. Uh, in Chicago at that time especially. Um, but So the objective was simple to just, uh, when the bar was ready, to just open the doors. Uh, we had to be very careful about entrapment. Uh, we did not uh, try to push them uh, toward a bribe. We did not offer a bribe. We just opened the doors, uh, let come in what will come in. Uh, and uh, they'll get around to the subject of, uh, well, maybe uh, you got so much going on here, maybe I can give you a break, uh, uh, is what it would come down to, um, uh, to get a pass. Uh, so to get a little bit of an idea of, uh, of what our uh, uh, bar looked like, it was basically uh, your uh, neighborhood bar, uh, pretty typical except for the two characters up uh, in the loft above the ladder there, <laughs> uh, where there was a little peephole uh, through the wall that we, that we shot through. And from that vantage, we could see uh, uh, 
pretty much the whole bar down there. Uh, is when uh, when people came in that uh, that were going to try and sh shake us down, but we didn't know at that point. We we were just assuming. Um, so the uh, uh, the it, and up in the uh, the loft uh, is. Uh, Myself there, and uh, and my uh, the other photographer, my co-photographer was uh, uh, Gene Pisek. Uh, there would have never been the both of us there at the same time. Uh, the idea was that somebody had to be available at all times, and that's why there were two of us. Um, so the cover for Gene and I, uh, uh, for the photographers. Uh, the because the bartenders were uh, uh, was a reporter uh, the uh, uh, everybody in there had a role that they were playing that were on the staff and we actually did hire some people that did not uh, uh, that were not uh, on the staff of the paper but they had no idea they thought they were just working at a bar they didn't know really what was going on so Gene and I. Uh, we had to have a cover, so our cover was that we would be repairmen uh, coming into the bar to fix something. And obviously, you looked around; there was plenty that needed fixing. Uh, so um, uh, we would be repairmen coming in. We would uh, walk into the bar if we got a call. Sometimes we just waited uh, there, uh, but if we got a call uh, from the assignment desk that said, "Go to your special." Uh, we had in the trunks of our car at all times, we had uh, workman's clothes, uh, and um, uh, we had workman's clothes, and we had a large toolbox. Um, and the assignment desk was instructed that during, uh, especially Monday through Friday during uh, business hours, uh, that one of us, either Gene or myself, would be in the downtown area. So if, we, if they got a call from, uh, from the bar that said, you know, send. We need a photographer at the special. That's all they would be told, and they they would have one of us available and send us. So, and oh, and the the pr purpose of that toolbox, incidentally, was to get our cameras in and out of the in and out of the bar when uh, when we were coming and going. But secrecy was absolutely of the highest priority. Um, uh, on this project, Chicago is an extremely competitive news town, and every paper is. We all got along pretty well with each other, uh, the other papers. But uh, still, when it came down to uh, the nitty gritty, uh, it was each man for himself. And in the year, objective was to get the better picture or the better story or whatever. Um, and this project was going to go on for several months. So to keep this whole concept under wraps for uh, four months, five months, uh, almost an impossible assignment, but we were going for it. The Chicago Sun-Times was a morning paper. Uh, the Chicago Daily News uh, was an evening paper. Both the Sun-Times and the Daily News were owned by Marshall Field. They were both in the same building. Actually, the city rooms for the Sun-Times and the Daily News uh, were on the same floor. There was a, a, a divider between them with <laughs> big glass windows in it. You could look over there and see who was coming and going. Uh, and the photographers shared dark rooms. And that ready room I described earlier, uh, the photographers uh, from both the Daily News and the Sun-Times were in there, but the deadlines were extremely, very different. For the Sun-Times, our deadlines, for we were a morning paper, uh, our first deadline would be 10 o'clock at night. That was for, we called the Bulldog Edition, uh, and that was for the papers that would go out to the train stations at the end of the line for the commuter trains. Uh, and then uh, the later deadlines would be uh, for the ones that would be on the newsstands uh, in the morning. And they would have the final sports, uh, uh, especially when the Bulls were in the heyday, uh, they would have uh, uh, the, the sports, uh, uh, could have the final scores in that edition and, and all. So um, uh, the, the the thing about sh the secrecy thing and the thing about sharing the dark rooms with other photographers, and then we're going to get on to more interesting stuff, okay? Uh, but in the film days, if you went into the dark room, uh, you uh, 
uh, an experienced photographer would pick up a, a negative, hold it up to the light, and 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 make a judgment uh, how how overexposed or underexposed or whatever it was, and then slide it into the uh, enlarger, and it would be a wild guess as to what that exposure should be, how how long the enlarger. You set the timer on the enlarger, and. Uh, so what I'm getting at is you would end up making two, three, four prints before you got one just the way you wanted it. Well, those first prints, until you got the one you wanted, would go wet, come out of the, the fixative, uh, and, and wouldn't be totally fixed yet, but they would go wet into the trash can. Okay, well, uh, there's going to be somebody following us into that dark room, another photographer, either with our own paper, who had no, they knew we were up to something but didn't know what, uh, or if a daily news photographer uh, came in, the first thing we would do, I mean, we all did it. You'd come into the dark room and you'd rifle through the wastebasket to see what the other guy's up to, you know. <laughs> and uh, so when we went into the dark room, in our pocket, we had a garbage bag uh, wadded up, and, and every print that uh, every reject went into that bag wet. Uh, when we got down to the the print we wanted, that one was uh, uh, put back in the chemicals till they were stabilized. Uh, they would be rinsed and dried. The dried prints would go into Stu Stuart Leary's uh, uh, office, uh, locked into a cabinet. Uh, the negatives and the prints. Uh, so, um, anyhow, it. Uh, so, uh, so when we actually started on the project, uh, the city inspectors uh, don't make necessarily make appointments on when they're going to show up. So a lot of the time, what I'm getting at is it's not always uh, uh, doing this uh, uh, clandestine work, this undercover work, is not always ex as exciting uh, as it may uh, you may think it is because there's a lot of time of just sitting hanging out in the bar waiting for this guy to show up uh, There's a limit to how much coca-cola you can drink in a day and um, and you wait uh, And then when they do show up, it's usually a very short visit, but 10 or 15 minutes of t Tension, I mean it's very intense while he's there uh, and you, you have to be quiet, you have to, if you, if you are visible in the bar, there has to be a reason you're there, and on and on. Before we really get, uh, start to go into the pictures, I want uh, one, one more thing, which will involve some pictures. Uh, but this last January was the 40th anniversary of uh, the, pub the publication when, when that first hit the streets. It actually, the publication ran for tw uh, 25 consecutive days, a different story every day, a different investigator, a different uh, a surprise that we didn't expect. A lot of stuff we had no idea was going to happen was the best, <laughs> the best stuff. Uh, but anyhow, uh, uh, last January was the anniversary, 40th, and uh, we had a party at, at the bar. Uh, which now, if you want to go visit it, it uh, when we sold it uh, after two months of, of uh, open for business, uh, it was bought by uh, uh, people that uh, called it the, the Brehan, Brehan Pub. And it still is the Brehan Pub. Much nicer place than the Mirage was. Uh, actually, quite a neat place. Uh, but anyhow, uh, we meet the team here. Uh, the way we looked uh, 40 years ago. <laughs> so uh, there's uh, Bill Rechtenwald uh, is uh, on the far end, Pam Zekman. Pam Zekman was, uh, it spearheaded the project. Uh, she had tried to sell her uh, uh, idea of buying a bar and doing this to the Tribune. She was working for, with the Tribune. She was on the staff at the Tribune. Uh, they, they would have no part of it. Uh, it, it was too risky. Uh, it, the lawsuits, their lawyers nixed it right away. Uh, so she crossed over the street, came over to the Sun Times, and this uh, actually the editors and the lawyers at the Sun Times said, "Hey, this sounds great," and they went for it. So the Sun Times, the, the Tribune has always been a little stuffy. And the Sun Times has always been a little more feisty, and uh, the, this story really proved it. Uh, so uh, there we have uh, Pam and uh, uh, 
Uh, Zay Smith, uh, uh, the middle guy, he's about my age. Uh, it, it was uh, a reporter, and he also was new on the staff. Uh, 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 Pam had been around the city quite a bit, and when uh, she was in the bar, because she's a redhead, she had her, uh, her hair was all under a bandana, and uh, uh, she camouflaged herself as well as she did. A few people through the course did recognize her. And, and then the uh, fellow on the plaid shirt, uh, we had to have a person, uh, and no one that, uh, on the staff at the same times could uh, be the owner of the bar because it would be traced back to the Sun Times. To get a liquor license uh, is uh, harder than getting on an airplane these days. Uh, I mean, you, you, you're fingerprinted, uh, you are uh, uh, background checks. Uh, if you have any uh, criminal uh, history, uh, you're not going to get a liquor license. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Jeff uh, was hired and and he was, I think he was a grandson actually of one of the editors, but, uh, and then you have yours truly uh, with the, the bushy mustache and, uh, now remember, this is the 1970s. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, and Gene Pusick, uh, 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 uh my partner in crime here. Um, oops, wrong button. Um, so, uh, actually this is last January, same, same players here, uh, uh, Zay is in the wheelchair there, Pam Zuckman, uh, how she does, I don't know, she didn't change a bit, uh, and uh, uh, Rechtenwald, myself, and uh, uh, the bald uh, fellow over there, you're gonna, he's the, currently the editor of the Sun-Times, and this fellow down here is Gene. Gene's 91 years old now, but he made it to this party, uh, and uh, it was a great time. Um, just to give you a little locator, uh, um, uh, you recognize the Sears Tower there. Uh, now, if you're younger than uh, 30 years old, you would recognize it as the Willis Tower. Uh, but for the next couple of generations, at least, to Chicagoans, it's the Sears Tower. And uh, the, the Mirage is about 17 blocks north of the, of the Sears Tower, uh, with a, a river in between them. And uh, uh, so, um, what I'm going to do now, and it might take me a while to get this started, but uh, I've got a little video here I want to show you, uh, which kind of really puts this whole thing into perspective. It looked like any neighborhood tavern in Chicago. The beer was cold and the bratwurst hot. The Sun Times scouted dozens of locations for this tavern and they found one that was just kind of outside the Rush Street Corridor in River North. The Sun Times now owned a tavern at 731 North Wells. It owned, in the language of the Bill of Sale, exactly this. One five-ton air conditioner, bar, 22 stools and back bar, two cash registers, two upright coolers, one underbar type cooler, one color TV with outside antenna, one three-barrel draft beer box, assorted glasses, books, refrigerators, home size, and kitchen, one ice cube maker, inoperable, light fixtures. The tavern would have to be kept secret from the Sun-Times' own city room. It was like keeping a salt lick from a community of deer. Even in an era where newspapers did a lot of uh, undercover journalism, heavy lifting, uh, reporters being able to take months to do work on one story, um, this one stood out because of its creativity and uh, the overall characters that the story brought out. This story exposed things in ways that Chicagoans, as they were actually reading the story in the Sun-Times, were chuckling at the schemes uncovered. Shakedowns, bribery, tax gyps from the lawyer that worked with them to uh, set up the bar, to the building inspectors coming in, to the fire inspector with the cigarette dangling out of his mouth as he's talking to them about their fire inspection. I mean, this was just a cast of Chicagoans. I think the reason we want to revisit the Mirage is really came during an era where there was a lot more undercover journalism going on. And the enormous success of this series sparked a real debate within journalism about is undercover reporting ethical. Um, there were Pulitzers awarded for underco undercover reporting. 
This one didn't get one, and that's one of the issues uh, I hope our three uh, subjects will fill us in on. So here we are. It is now Sunday, January 8th, 1978. This was the first, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, day that this series was going to run. It would run uh, 25, uh, 25 days, uh, and then actually it ended up running months beyond that because the, uh, now everybody was willing to talk. Uh, it was out there, uh, and everybody that was afraid to talk before, uh, it, was, it was all unwrapped. And, uh, uh, we had to set up a bank of phones uh, that just to, to deal with the calls coming in of people wanting to tell their story. Uh, so, um, the story that saw print that that saw print that day uh, was literally seen around the world uh, by in the next 24 hours. The AP picked it up and put it on the wires everywhere. I mean, London, they I mean they just love this kind of story, you know, of uh, of uh, uh, the government getting caught cheating, you know, and uh, uh, it was. Uh, uh, I mean, we were all uh, uh, as. Uh, uh, it's been said before, we all had our 15 minutes of fame uh, when, when this story broke. Uh, but the, the payoffs, the thing that was uh, just so unbelievable is how small the payoffs were. Uh, the fire inspector, uh, there, I mean, there were, that place could have gone up in smoke at any time. Uh, and $10. Ten dollars, and he saw nothing. He saw nothing. He uh, gave us a clean slate and walked out the door for ten bucks. Uh, uh, and some, uh, some, some went higher than that. Uh, it, it, some as much as as uh, as a uh, hundred dollars. Uh, the uh, the uh, liquor inspectors uh, they they had a little bigger lever. Uh, if you're going to sell liquor uh, by the glass over the bar. Uh, there's an extra tax that goes on it. And when, buy, when I walk into a, a liquor store and buy a bottle that, uh, of something that, say, I pay $20 for, uh, a, a bar would probably pay $30 or $40 for that same bottle. Uh, and, it will have a, and theirs will have a sticker on it that says the tax has been paid. Uh, however, uh, we had planted several bottles on our back bar uh, that didn't have stickers on them to see what the liquor inspector would say. Well, uh, basically what it came down to is what his take would be. He says, whatever's in your cash register, just give it to me and, you're, and I'm out of here. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, the way it went on. Day after day, the vending, vend vending machine companies uh, were, before we opened, they were lined up uh, outside the door uh, trying to get in. They wanted their machines in our bar. It's a new bar. They wanted their machines in. And they were uh, uh, all bargaining as how much they would skim off of the top of when went into that machine, uh, and they would split it with us. Uh, whatever they skimmed off, uh, it, it just it just went on and on. We'll be talking about the vending guys in a couple of minutes, a little more. Uh, but then, the one thing that we just never anticipated is that our teacher, uh, our teacher was going to be the accountant that we hired, uh, and uh, uh, this fellow right here, Philip Barash, uh, he was he's he's told us, he said, I know all the angles. Stick with me. I save you lots of money. And he had angles. Uh, it, it, it began uh, with Philip. Uh, uh, he said uh, uh, he was going to, he promised that he was going to teach us how to make more profit Chicago style. Uh, and it began with slicing 40% off the top of all that came into the bar, 40%. Uh, and, 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 and then he taught us uh, how that to make sure that that 40% uh, slice off the top is not noticed. Now, if you, if you only sold 2,000 drinks last month, don't turn in a bill for 8,000 uh, uh, bar napkins, you know, <laughs> they, they're going to figure that out. Uh, but anyhow, uh, 
it was estimated, um, I'm getting ahead of myself here, um, but it was, a, it was a nice reduction in our tax bill. Mr. Barash uh, is giving us, uh, giving us our lessons right now, and he is telling us, he says, listen carefully, listen carefully to me now. He says, I want you to take two plain envelopes, nothing written on them, just two plain envelopes. I want you in those envelopes to put a $10 bill in each one. I want you to put one of my cards, one of my cards in each one so they know that I'm, uh, that I'm helping you. And I, I want you, to, when the fire inspector comes in, I want him to get uh, one envelope. And when the building inspector comes in, I want him to get the other envelope. And he said, and actually, you don't give it to him. He says, there's nothing on that envelope. It's a white envelope. Uh, he says, you lay it on the bar there. He's going to have his papers there that have to be signed and everything. You just leave it, lay it on the bar there. He'll know what it is. He'll know what it is. He won't say anything. Uh, when he's going to leave, he just uh, will shuffle it in with his papers and walk out. Yes? Did he know you guys were reporters? Oh, no. He wasn't oh, in oh, no. Uh, I, no, no one did. Uh, there were precious few people that knew that we were, I mean, that was the whole, because this was going to go on for months before it is printed. Oh, yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Barash was so uh, uh, thorough with us that uh, we, uh, they, uh, I say we, uh, Pam and, and her people uh, hired uh, five more accountants and kept separate books on all six of the accountants just to see how much they, how they would instruct us and how much it would vary. Actually, all six of them uh, had a plan. <laughs> pretty, pretty similar to uh, uh, Mr. Barash. Uh, and some of them went, were trimming as much as 70% off. Uh, some of them were trimming, um, um, it, what, it, what it came down to, and I'm really getting ahead of myself now, but that's okay. Uh, what it really came down to is it was estimated uh, that, uh, that uh, the state of Illinois uh, was losing $16 million a year just on all of the bars and, and other businesses, I'm sure, uh, that were skimming their profits. 16 million a year was, was the closest estimate that they came up with. Statewide or just from Chicago? Uh, and that, I'm sure that was statewide, but uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question, actually. I have to call Pam. <laughs> but um, so, then the uh, payoff parade begins. Uh, they, uh, next in was the fire inspector, uh, with, uh, or the first in, I should say, was the fire inspector. And uh, there he is looking uh, uh, under the, at the cooler under the bar, the cooler, by the way, which didn't uh, work. It actually was a good place to grow mold uh, down there. And, uh, uh, and uh, Pam uh, is now down in the basement right under the bar where all of the plumbing and pipes were leaking. And, and uh, it, it's amazing that the whole floor didn't come crashing in when the place was jammed at night and people jumping around and dancing and sometimes fighting. Uh, it was, wasn't the finest neighborhood in town. Uh, so, uh, so the payoff parade uh, goes on and on. Uh, uh, the next guy that we're going to meet here, uh, actually, uh, he was not doing anything wrong. Uh, this fellow is uh, uh, Francis Murphy. He's the uh, chief of the city's uh, Fire Prevention Bureau. And uh, uh, this is after the fire inspector had left. Uh, Pam went and paid a call on, uh, uh, on uh, Mr. Murphy and actually uh, didn't mention anything at all about the Mirage. Uh, and she uh, identified herself as a reporter, and she said, uh, Mr. Murphy, what would you do? What would you do if, uh, if I uh, told you that uh, one of your inspectors would just pick up a white, uh, uh, a white envelope with $10 and give a pass on, on an entire budget? What, what would you do, Mr. Murphy? I'd crucify him, was the answer. I'd, I say it again, I'd crucify him. Well, uh, uh, 
he probably would have. Uh, you see in this picture the, the steps. He says, uh, uh, he says that one of the worst things you can do is nothing is allowed on the stairs because it's the best way to kill somebody, he says. And, and the bare wires. And, and up on the wall, uh, there, uh, that's the gas meter. And there's chemicals stacked all around it. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, but uh, it, it go, went on and on, just day after day after day. Um, it was like another day, another payoff. Uh, this is a building inspector. Uh, and actually, he has the envelope in his hand right now. And he is uh, 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 just putting it in, not saying anything about it, just casually picks it up, puts it in with his papers, and leaves. Um, uh, and, and actually, he came a little more expensive. He, he required $15. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that, but he uh, didn't see the rotting floors. He, uh, he, he didn't see the, uh, uh, the, 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 the back wall, uh, the wall that was actually in, that we were shooting through. Uh, that back wall, uh, the 2 by 4s were going the wrong way in it. I, I didn't understand that completely, but it, it's against code anyhow. And, uh, but in addition to the 2 by 4s going the wrong way uh, in that back wall, uh, there, uh, there was no drywall on it. Uh, there was just a, a sheet of paneling, and there's supposed to be drywall behind that paneling. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's, that's pretty flammable material uh, uh, there. So. Uh, uh, he noticed that, he mentioned it as a matter of fact, uh, but then uh, uh, it didn't show up in his report. Um, so, then comes a big surprise. Uh, we got an honest cop. <laughs> we got, now, I'm not going to imply that, that uh, all crops in Chicago are crooked. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of honest cops in Chicago, but there are plenty that are not. Uh, but meet, uh, meet Mr. Uh, Lou Cuddy. Uh, uh, he was actually, um, I'm going to have to read this because it's so complex. Uh, I'll get it messed up if I don't. Uh, but uh, uh, the, what, it, what it's going to come down to is that it, he played it by the law, by the rule. Every T was crossed, every I was dotted. Uh, but he didn't have enough clout. Uh, to hold back, <laughs> he didn't have enough clout in his own department to hold it back. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so anyhow, Lou Cuddy was a police investigator who's, uh, who checks applications for liquor licenses. So we were uh, applying for our liquor license. Uh, the bar still was not opened at that point. Uh, Lou informed us that he's going to need fingerprints, he's going to need ID papers, he's going to need affidavits, and on and on he's going to need this. The point he was making uh, is that this process is going to take some time, a, a week, maybe two weeks, to get all of this done. So don't plan on opening your doors, you know, Monday. Uh, now, this is the place when the inspectors uh, might add uh, their uh, they might drop a line right now. Yeah, it's going to take time, it's going to take time, but yeah, don't worry about it. We can work something out. That, that was usually what it came to leading up to. Uh, they, they were uh, ripe for a payoff. Uh, but Mr. Cuddy had a little different approach on that. Mr. Cuddy, uh, when they sat down, uh, and, and Pam was there, and, and it would have been Jeff, uh, because the, everything was in his name, uh, when, when they sat down at Mr. Cuddy's desk, um, he put a, a piece of paper, a card, on the table in front of them. And that card, uh, it was written on the card, any effort to influence me with a gratuity will be considered a bribe and will be prosecuted as a felony. Uh, that was, uh, uh, <laughs> and, and he was consistent with that. They came back uh, at a later date uh, Offer, uh, asking, um, they, uh, they were going to test him again to see if he would still play it straight. And, uh, and the second time they came in, we wanted to go from a two o'clock opening. They needed a special uh, uh, closing. I mean, uh, instead of a 2 a.m. closing, uh, they wanted a, a special permit, which were available for more money, uh, to get a 4 a.m. closing. 
Uh, so, and, and, but he played, he played the game exactly straight uh, at that time. But meanwhile, while this is going on, the delays waiting for this print is driving the vending co uh, company operators crazy because they want to be first in line to get their machines in our bar because you can't have two companies with vending machines, they'll shoot each other uh, in, in the same bar. Uh, but uh, uh, they, um, uh, they were courting the Mirage for uh, a contract and uh, unbeknownst to the Mirage, they were calling Lou Cuddy trying to prod him along. Uh, and uh, uh, Cuddy calls the bar and he says, what the hell is going on here? What is going on? The, these companies are calling me, I've got work to do, and uh, <coughs> you know, it's, it's just not gonna, I, it, you know, it's gonna take what I said it's gonna take. Uh, and, and then he got suspicious of Pam. He was thinking that she was, maybe she was a madam and uh, we were planning on opening a, a girly joint there. Well, <laughs> come on, we already had two girly joints within a block. I mean, it, uh, uh, but uh, uh, Mr. back to Mr. Barash, uh, he, one tip that he had given us, he says, if you're having problems, if you're having problems with anybody uh, at the city hall, if you're having problems, um, what you do is you call your precinct captain. Now every precinct has an alderman, but every alderman has a precinct captain. And the precinct captain, his job is to keep the, the residents in that, in that precinct happy so that they'll vote for that alderman again. So uh, they, they get things done. And so the precinct captains usually have a fair amount of clout. Actually, uh, the, our precinct captain was Frank Bruno. Now, Frank Bruno had clout. Uh, as a matter of fact, Frank Bruno, in his regular job, uh, he was in the administrative staff of George Dunn, who happened to be the uh, Cook County uh, Board of the, uh, the president of the Cook County Board. Uh, so, uh, uh, so using a tip from Mr. Barash, uh, Pam calls Frank Bruno and uh, explains, well, uh, you know, we're trying to get this this push through, uh, we're trying to get it through because we gotta open up, we gotta, we gotta open our tavern, we can't afford to be closed another two weeks. And so uh, Bruno says, <coughs> well, he'll see if he can move things along a little faster. Now, uh, Frank Bruno, not being somebody to mess around, they, they hang up the phone, and uh, five minutes later, Pam's phone rings, and it's Frank. He says, uh, this afternoon, later this afternoon, he says, uh, go over to the license bureau and pick up your license, it's waiting for you. Five minutes. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, the point of that is uh, that, uh, that uh, Mr. Bruno was able to go over Lou Cuddy's head. He went to supervisors and the, and the and licensing bureau, uh, went over his head, and they pushed the license through, and Cuddy's sitting there help us. Although he was doing everything right. You gotta love the guy. Uh, so we move along. Uh, oh, we got time yet. Yeah. Uh, we move along and uh, uh, the mission is accomplished. Uh, the bar had been open for, for two months. Uh, there was a, about a month getting it ready to be open. Then it was open for about a month. Had a party the last night. It was gonna be closed the next day. Uh, actually, the people in the neighborhood did not know that, uh, but there was a big party. Uh, the bar would be closed. Uh, it, it had only been open for two months, and it would be closed, but the investigation was definitely not finished. There would be another at least two months of, of just ch fact-checking, chasing down every lead that we had ever been given, uh, and, and con uh, confirming it, uh, so that uh, we're not setting ourselves up for that lawsuit. Uh, however, uh, th that had some effect on us as, as Gene and I as photographers. It's a, a whole different ball game for us. Our method of operation is now drastically changing. When we were in the bar, they were coming to us. Uh, we had our, our cozy little place up there. We were hiding and we'd take the pictures. Uh, now we're gonna have to go 
we're going to have to go out uh, to find the people, because there were many people in this scheme that never had a reason to come to the bar, like Lou Cuddy was one, but there were other people that uh, uh, were involved in the, in the schemes, but they, they had never actually physically been in the bar. So when the stories ran, we needed to have pictures of, of everybody, so that was our job. So Gene and I, uh, I no longer had control of the environment. Now we are learning how to be a paparazzo. We are, <laughs> uh, that involves uh, uh, long stakeouts in vans with darkened out windows, uh, with curtains on, uh, black curtains on the windows behind you, uh, and uh, uh, shooting through uh, darkened windows, telephoto lenses, and thermoses of coffee. That was the way our life was going to be for the next couple months. Uh, but it worked out. Actually, uh, Officer Cuddy was a good example of this. Um, his case was a little more difficult uh, uh, because uh, his office is in a police station. And uh, so I'm going to go in and, and, and pop a picture of Mr. Cuddy, and uh, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I, even though he was honest, he's not going to want his picture taken uh, in connection with anything. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, fortunately, his desk could be th seen through a window in the hallway. Uh, I took a BGA uh, person with me. The reason I had a BGA person, the, the Better Government Association, uh, 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 they were working with us on this project. And uh, uh, the reason I, I because I, I wouldn't know Lou Cuddy was a, a, a office full of uh, uh, plain clothes cops. Uh, uh, I'm not going to know who's Cuddy. So he came along so he could point out uh, which one I needed to photograph. Uh, so there we are standing out in the hallway. There's this window and there's uh, Mr. Cuddy in the background. But you know, I'm not going to walk up to the window and start taking pictures. I'm going to wake up in jail tomorrow morning. Uh, so anyhow, I had the BGA guy stand in front of me. I said, He's right out in the middle of the hall. I says, Stand in front of me. I'm going to take your picture. So I stand back. Now, instead of having a lens on where I would be shooting somebody three feet in front of me, I have a longer lens on, so I'm shooting over his shoulder and taking a picture of uh, Officer Cuddy. Uh, it worked, and uh, uh, we got through it. But uh, that was just uh, an example of uh, 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 just an example of. Uh, uh, being in a, in a different, uh, not having control of the environment. So uh, we had other visitors. Uh, 60 Minutes uh, got involved with this. Mike Wallace uh, and crew uh, actually spent, uh, actually visited four times while while the bar was open for business. Had visited four times, uh, uh, and so how uh, how are. Uh, and so how are you going to sneak Mike Wallace, uh, his director, uh, his camera crew, how are you going to sneak them in and out of a bar? Uh, you're not. Well, the, w the way it happened, well, first of all, their equipment's not going to fit in a, in a workman's toolbox, and uh, uh, especially in those days. Uh, but it, there was a door. Uh, he never actually did any filming in the bar itself. but. Uh, there was a door in the back that came into that back room uh, where we worked from, uh, Gene and I, uh, and there was the stairs down into the basement were there. So they were down in the basement, actually where a lot of the uh, uh, violations were very obvious down there, the dripping pipes and the bare wires and everything. Uh, and they did filming down there and they interviewed people uh, down there. Uh, and they got in and out, uh, and, and of course, under the understanding they were not going to air anything until it was published in the, in the paper. Um, there, there was one little close call on that. Uh, one of the part-time part bartenders uh, uh, came, uh, they were set up filming down in the basement. One of the uh, part-time bartenders, who has no idea what's going on, uh, uh, comes strolling down the steps, and uh, Bill Rechtenwald, he's the the uh, uh, BGA guy uh, and Pam there. Uh, Bill <laughs> runs over to the bottom of the steps and tells him, 
No, you, you can't be down here now. You can't be down here. The architect is, uh, they're going to do major remodeling and they're filming all of this uh, and to figure out how they're going to remodel it, da, 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 whatever, but go back upstairs. And he did. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that was possibly one close call. Uh, there was another close call uh, was uh, yours truly uh, was in the bar uh, working, uh, 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 actually waiting, I should say, for an inspector to show up. I had been there for some time, but I was told that there would be, for this inspector, there would be absolutely no reason for him to go up on the loft. That loft was above the uh, toilets, uh, and uh, uh, as the bar had like a 16-foot ceiling, and uh, uh, so, but I, I was told there would be no reason for this inspector to go up there. So don't worry about it, because I had a camera sitting on a tripod uh, right at the little opening we were shooting through. Uh, so I was hanging out in the bar when the inspector arrived. So where does this guy go? He goes right to the back room uh, immediately, and Jeff is, uh, of course, tailing along with him. And uh, he says, oh, I want to go up there. I want to go up there. And he's reaching for the light switch. And Jeff screams at him. He says, no, don't turn on that. It blows fuses every time you turn it on. And I'm standing right behind. Uh, I'm standing right at the door at that point. And I say, OK, uh, I tell you what, I got a flashlight up there. I'm working up there. I got a flashlight up there. Just hold on. I'll go get the flashlight. So I go up. It's dark up there. I'm fumbling around trying to get the camera off of the tripod. It's stuck. It doesn't want to come off. I'm uh, cursing and I'm making noise. And I say, oh, where is it? I, I know I left it up here. Where did I put it? You know, and uh, anyhow, finally I uh, uh, get the camera off, stuff it back in the toolbox, uh, take the flashlight, go down, hand it to the inspector. He goes up, boom, 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 two seconds, he comes back down. Uh, that was the closest call I ever had to, because he walked up and saw that camera in front of that, on the tripod in front of that hole. He, he, he would put two and two together very quickly, I think. I, I did a little uh, thing on my own. Uh, I decided I was going to give out some awards. Uh, and I was going to give out an award for the, uh, for the honesty uh, and for uh, corruption and immorality. Uh, and so, winner for the uh, a drum roll here, winner for the honesty obviously goes to Officer Cuddy. Uh, win, winner for corruption and immorality uh, definitely goes to uh, Mr. Barash, uh, who, who gave us good lessons and opened up many interesting stories for us, but the guy was uh, kind of a little sleazy. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Cuddy, <clears throat> tried so hard <clears throat> to play by the rules, he, uh, uh, it, which is, has, we found out, very uh, rare for uh, investigators. But, uh, uh, but when his own supervisors went over his head and pushed, uh, uh, pulled that liquor license through, uh, I, I mean, it, that, you would have thought would have crushed him. Pam uh, called him uh, after, uh, after the story had run and all, and she, she called him and uh, he says, well, what is your reaction? What is your reaction when, when, when your own people uh, uh, jerked that out of your hand and passed it through? <laughs> and uh, and uh, Lou, being a pretty cool guy, kind of takes everything in stride. He gets a little philosophical here. And he says, well, you know, the law is the law. But Chicago is Chicago. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was all Lou had to say on the issue. Um, so anyhow, uh, just to kind of, of uh, wrap this up, uh, hey, we're doing pretty good on time. I'm right on time, actually. Um, uh, so the Mirage assignment was the, the, really the very beginning of my son Time's career. Uh, and I, I retired from the Sun-Times uh, about 30 years later, uh, in 06, actually. Uh, I didn't retire from uh, photography, but I did retire from the Sun-Times. I, I still uh, exercising in that camera a little bit. Um, but, uh, and this, the assignment was absolutely a windfall for me. It opened many doors for me uh, down the road, uh, being able to, uh, 
uh, because of the amount of pu publicity it received. Um, but I really did not want to spend the rest of my life, rest of my career, photographing people through a peephole. It just wasn't my idea what I got into this business for. <laughs> and uh, uh, however, I did do a couple more uh, uh, undercover projects with Pam following that. Uh, the most uh, 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 probably is shaking is the Mirage story was there was a doctor in Chicago that was operating an abortion clinic, and a large abortion clinic. And uh, he, uh, it became uh, evidence some women were complaining that, you know, everybody that goes to see a doctor, I can't even remember his name, everybody that goes to this clinic, uh, they're pregnant. They never, when they, when they get the test back, uh, and it's a urine test always. So. Pam, being rather clever, uh, has figured the way to tackle this problem was uh, we, uh, she found four uh, female reporters at the paper. Uh, and of course, the, the test is a urine test that's going to determine uh, if you're pregnant or not. And uh, so she found four, uh, four reporters that agreed that they would go over and, uh, uh, and want to be tested. And so then she went and found four guys, four male reporters, and uh, gave them each a bottle <laughs> and said, uh, yeah, uh, give us a little sample. And so they did. And then uh, so each of the women uh, were given a bottle, and they went over and uh, uh, said they wanted to be tested. And, you know, every one of them came back positive. They were pregnant. <laughs> and they had gone into the room, of course, and poured uh, a little of uh, uh, from the bottle they had been given. So anyhow, having uh, said that, I did a couple more projects, but uh, uh, then I, I really my 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 love uh, for photography involved a more uh, uh, a documentary and uh, working with people uh, face to face. Uh, they can see me; I can see them. Uh, it, it, but also, I kind of a, am a control freak, and I, uh, uh, I, I like to have uh, control of situations, uh, uh, a little more uh, control of photography, lighting, and, uh, and whatever. And a position opened up at the Sun-Times uh, uh, for the studio photographer. They had one studio photographer. And uh, so I asked for it. They were a little reluctant at first, but they gave it to me. So I spent the rest of my career shooting fashion, shooting food, uh, architecture, uh, portraits of uh, 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 portraits of uh, whoever was in the news, uh, whatever. Uh, as a, a studio photographer, my responsibilities, well, as I said, were food, fashion, portraits. Uh, uh, actually, I worked with Roger Ebert a lot. Uh, he would. Uh, 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 if uh, a movie was about to be uh, uh, released, uh, a new movie, uh, of course, they uh, want to get as much press on it as they can. And of course, Roger uh, was about as high as you could get uh, as far as getting uh, press. So the, uh, the leading actors, actresses, uh, or the, the directors, or the writers would come in and interview with Roger. and. Uh, Quite often, because I was living downtown at that time, uh, quite often uh, I, I would get, get sent with him. Great guy to work with, by the way. Uh, one of these people that, uh, um, Roger, of course, is gone now, but, uh, uh, you know, he treated everybody the same. I could be in the room with Roger, uh, and uh, he would treat me the same as he would treat uh, Michael Douglas or, or, or Kirk, the father, or what, whoever it was in the room. Um, that's just the way he was. Great guy. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> After the story broke, how was your reception in bars and taverns? Did people recognize you? Uh, well, I not me, no, or Gene. I mean, we we never got that much visibility. Uh, it wasn't in, uh, until the story was running uh, that once in a while uh, a picture of us would be when they were explaining how things were done uh, further into the story. But uh, no, 
I didn't. I was, was a little cautious uh, at times because the mafia was involved with the vending machine companies and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, I watched my rear view mirror some, but uh, uh, never was a problem. Yes, uh, a lady back here. Was. What happened to all the people with these corrupt practices? They had to go over the fines and they were sent to jail? Uh, they were, uh, as far as I know, I don't think any went to jail, but they, uh, uh, most of them were uh, nearing retirement. Uh, the, they get those kind of jobs and they were suspended. They were, I mean, here's a guy 60 years old, the fire inspector, this guy. Uh, I, you know, he's like a year or so away from retirement. It's gone. Uh, there will be none. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, that was the punishment, uh, I guess. I, I'm not aware of any that actually had uh, uh, been charged with felony. Yes? I'm, I'm from Chicago, and I, I remember this so clearly. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, the... Um, I was wondering what the, uh, you know, what other reforms, if any, were enacted after this. They came out with that, uh, the Shackman decree that I think was supposed to kind of do away with uh, patronage, um, which doesn't relate exactly to this, but sort of, because that's how you get those jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was sometime after this. Uh, and then, but um, but but Daly was Daly was not mayor at the time. Daly had already died. Daly, I think, died in December of '76. And that was before Richie. Uh, so uh, was yeah, this was the first or Richard J. The first. Yeah. <laughs> Daly the first. Yeah. Yeah. He died just like six months before he started that. He said in early no June '77. So that's like seven months after or six months. Okay. Six months after Daly died, I think. It, right, but the system was still operating. Oh yeah, operating. yeah. Because the, you had an inter was, But uh, you're right, the daily himself. There was, was a quick succession of mayors, an interim mayor, and then that got was tied up in court. And then Eugene Sawyer was mayor, and then and then Galandic was mayor, and then the yep. snowstorm. Yeah, Galandic actually was uh, involved in uh, a lot of this. He was trying to protect some of the uh, uh, some of the people uh, for a time. I mean, it's, that's really out of my uh, my area of of knowledge, but uh, uh, it's uh, that there was there's so much more that I just I, I had to trim out so much. Sure. I mean, they, I could have gone on for hours. So, uh, so the other question I had was, I know the, the mafia control, like all the vending machines and the uh, jukeboxes, pinball, everything like that. Right. But I was wondering if you know during the time that the Mirage was set up if they ever came and shook the bar down for protection money or something like that. Not, no, that, no, that never happened. Uh, actually, as far as, there was one company called the Cena uh, Pending Company that there uh, was pretty general knowledge that they had mock connections, uh, and I don't know how many others did. Uh, possibly they were the only one, because I can't imagine the mock having two fighting against each other. But uh, anyway, the, the Zenith was one of the bidders trying to get into the Mirage. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who actually got it. Yes? How could an honest tavern keeper keep in business with all this crap going on? He, he gets, it's the slot machines, and uh, are not slot machines, but uh, his uh, truth box and all that was a payoff. And he has a payoff to a building inspector. He's got to pay off all of these people. How can an honest guy keep a keep a tavern open? Yeah, well, actually, with the like with the vending companies, they were actually giving us money. Uh, they were skimming uh, off the top, but they were trying to get the contract, uh, and that, that's what they would promise us that if they, when they emptied out the machines and uh, this many quarters came out, uh, they would uh, skim off a, a percentage of it, and they would keep some and they would give the bar some uh, and and that of course wouldn't be uh, uh, recorded as income so and the amounts were so low and, and the amounts would have been much less uh, right compared with uh, skimming 70% uh, off of your total take uh, of the month yes sir 
Um, I think that you didn't have any audio. Sound check? Yeah, audio. Sound. You didn't have any sound report. Oh, okay. oh we didn't. No. no. Uh, and in fact, in Illinois, it was not legal uh, at that time. I, I'm not sure if it is now. But it was not legal to uh, record any uh, uh, interviews and use it as evidence. Well, that's a good one. Because it would have been a lot more... Uh, I wasn't yeah. aware of it either. I read it in the book about the Mirage. If there had been some audio, they actually get an idea of what these uh, corrupt people were thinking or saying. Yeah, it was uh, recorded. Uh, I mean, kind of... Uh, on paper, but uh, not not audio. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You briefly mentioned one name of a reform act, I, I believe. But do you know if there were any like broad changes in practice, or did things kind of continue <coughs> the same as they had before? You know, it, 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 for a short time at least, there were huge changes, uh, and I'm sure it has drifted back some. Uh, it, wearing a different hat probably um, but I'm not I'm not aware I mean there they uh, if, if you get a copy of the book uh, the Mirage by Random House of uh, say in Pam uh, there there are chapters of, of all the, what the, the results of what the, uh, this investigation brought down uh, and there were several yes I think this gentleman is next. How did 60 Minutes treat it out of the broadcast? When did 60 Minutes do their story? You know, I, I could look back. And okay. It, it, it ran uh, after the, it had been running for a while in some times, and it was uh, it was on a Sunday night that it ran. And um, um, I, I actually have the date of it. Uh, that, that uh, what you're looking at is the cover of a special section. Uh, after it was all over, the Sun Times printed a special section of all of the stories that right. resulted from it, and, and all of the slides that I showed you. I, actually, mysteriously, the negative disappeared. Um, we, the Sun Times, you know, used to be uh, what is now Trump Tower. I mean, that was the footprint of that building. Was yeah. our building, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, and they, uh, we. I was still at the paper then, and uh, we had to move. I, I had the box of negatives locked in a cage back in the photo department. Uh, and then it got transferred up into uh, an equipment room up on the roof of the building. Uh, and I wasn't even aware of that. And I was looking for them. I couldn't <coughs> find them. I went to the picture of it. And he said, oh, I know where they are. They're up in the So he went up with me. We spent a couple of days searching for them. I mean, there were just boxes full of stuff up there. Uh, and, and we were about to be moving out of that building and uh, this stuff now and ever. Now somebody has them because pictures were showing up, uh, if, for example, in that video that I, I had saved a few myself, but uh, not to the extent. There, there was a lot of fresh pictures in that I didn't ask. You know? mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Uh, it, but it, it had... I could not find the box that I had been hiding for a long time. So that whole neighborhood's a lot different now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, just it's, been it's, it's all it's all it's very art, trendy. Art yeah, very trendy. Yeah, very yeah. very yeah. gentrified. It was very seedy at that time. It, it was. It, yes. Um, I was just curious. So the photographers, you would all develop your own film. Oh well, you there have, were like, one person who there would done? there were lab people. That would, uh, that you know, we were kind of kind of picky about our pictures, right. and uh, if, if we were on deadline, for example, a lot of times, especially on night game uh, sports, um, we we hired motorcycle guys to run the film back into the down to the paper, and so you'd still be shooting, uh, and and that's when the lab guys would would process the film, make the prints, and all. And, and you know, it was never good enough for us, you know. I mean, we wanted to do it ourselves. We all had our little formulas for form, uh, different uh, uh, developers that give, uh, give a different green structure or whatever. And uh, 
uh, we were, you know, we were young then. We were purists. <laughs> and, and it was the 70s. <laughs> um, and this is another question. Then when you left in 2006, uh, what size was the editorial staff then? Because like, when you said you started, it was quite huge. And I just was curious. It, it had much. diminished considerably. When I went to the Sun-Times, there were 23 photographers on the staff. Uh, and it wasn't too long later. Well, Marshall Field was forced to sell the paper. Uh, he had a he had a brother that turned 21, uh, who was entitled to half of the uh, everything the Marshall family owned. And uh, the younger brother wanted his in cash, and he wanted it now. And Marshall had no, he had to sell. He, he, that was the only way he could give his brother the half. So, um, um, so anyhow, or you. I want to tell you. Oh, so anyhow, then staff. yes. After after the Daily News, uh, after Marshall Field was out of the paper, it started to diminish because investment companies were they were looking at uh, were buying the paper, and it changed hands again and again. Uh, and and uh, it it was. Um, um, it, it, the staff had diminished to 11, I think, uh, photographers. Mm -hmm. um, and it might have been even a little lower than that by the time I left. Actually, I wasn't gone more than a few years, uh, and they eliminated the former staff. Mm -hmm. Eliminated it. I went down and picketed with them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, yeah. I, and, and then they hired back a few on a contract basis. Uh, and actually, to have a staff uh, of that size of, of uh, 23 photographers, uh, that was a luxury at that time. Marshall Field just loved the newspaper business. He just loved it. And, uh, and he, he had very deep pockets uh, for it. But, uh, uh, you know, that, at the New York Times, uh, I spent a lot of time in New York when I got uh, the studio assignment. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in New York. And the New York Times, uh, they only had a few photographers, uh, maybe five, uh, uh, but they had tons of stringers uh, that would, uh, and, and those people were hungry, uh, and they would go out and, and, and shoot uh, 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 a lot of uh, paparazzi uh, 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 types, but there were also good journalists uh, uh, that uh, supplying them with photos, and, uh, and, and, and actually, the, uh, a paper like the New York Times uh, didn't want paparazzi. They, 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 you know, they would be altering, interfering, uh, 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 it, not playing by the rules of journalism. Listen, this was fun for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.